Good afternoon. My name is Melanie Bates and I'm a council member for the section of civil rights and social justice and vice chair of its criminal justice section. We are thrilled to be presenting today's webinar, The Obligation of Lawyers to Facilitate Effective Reentry. This webinar is sponsored by the ABA section of civil rights and social justice and is part of our State of Criminal Justice webinar series. We are actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues, so please visit AmericanBar.org backslash CRSJ for updates on these programs. We would like to give a huge thank you to Ali Keysgard, Associate Director, for all of her support in preparing us for this discussion today. We would also like to acknowledge that attorney, author, and founder Jared Adams is not able to be with us today, but we would like to thank him for his hard work in leadership and everything that he's doing across the country to advance social justice. And we will put links to his work in the chat for you to learn more and connect with him outside of the program. During today's webinar, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A, not in the chat function. If you do not see the controls, please ensure your screen is not idle we will be monitoring the question and answer section and we'll do our best to address your questions, time permitting. We'll be sharing a recording of this program with everyone who is registered so that you can share it widely with your networks. And with that, we'd like to start with a brief moment of silence for everyone who's not able to be with us today, but is forever in our hearts. Thank you. The United States has just 5% of the world's population, but is home to approximately 25% of our world's incarcerated residents. Today, close to 2.3 million Americans are incarcerated, and according to the United States Department of Justice, more than 650,000 persons are released from prison every year. These residents face an overwhelming number of obstacles and burdens when attempting to piece back their lives. I want you to close your eyes and really think about it. Imagine being dropped off on a street corner with nothing but the clothes on your back after being isolated from society for decades. How would you eat? Where would you sleep? Would you know how to get a driver's license, find a job? Probably not. Without adequate support and resources, our residents returning home from incarceration are forced to fend for themselves. Serving time has many detrimental effects on one's rehabilitation process. This includes lost connections with family and loved ones, lack of adequate education and programming opportunities, and severely limited reentry efforts prior to release. We believe that lawyers have an obligation an obligation to ensure that the protections afforded under the United States Constitution are applied fairly to all people. This includes supporting the rights of persons returning home following a period of incarceration. And also, ABA Model Rule 6.1 urges all lawyers to provide at least 50 hours of pro bono service per year. Today, you will learn how you can make a meaningful impact on the lives of those who need us most. And I'd like to acknowledge that today we are leading with lived experience. This includes people who have been personally touched by the system, whether arrested, incarcerated, or have loved ones behind the wall. The directly impacted population should be part of each and every conversation regarding reform. That is from ideal formulation to strategy development to implementation and even post assessment. It should go without saying that directly impacted persons are on the front lines and can provide the most effective solutions to these complex issues. Their stories are powerful and should be at the core of any reform efforts. We must ensure that the directly impacted population is included on any panel discussion, roundtable, or meeting related to the topic. And with that, I will now introduce our esteemed panelists, both who have been directly impacted and wrongfully convicted by this system. First, we have Dr. Carmen Johnson, author and founder of Helping Ourselves to Transform. 
For over 25 years, Dr. Carmen Johnson has tirelessly forged an indelible legacy, igniting and invigorating diverse communities across social, civic, and economic fronts. She is Director of Court Watch and Judicial Accountability, a cornerstone powered by Life After Release. Life After Release Court Watch program stems from Carmen's unwavering commitment to spare others from her own horroring ordeal within the justice system. Dr. Johnson holds a PhD in philosophy, a scholar of metaphysics, and science of the mind and mental science. Additionally, Dr. Johnson holds certification as a paralegal, having undertaken extensive studies in criminal justice domain. Currently, she's pursuing an American with Disabilities Legal Advocate at Syracuse University. Dr. Johnson remains undeterred by past injustices by sitting on countless boards and committees dealing with socially impacted people. She is working on a second book to shed light on the challenges faced by people returning home, particularly women and our youth. Dr. Johnson's journey, spiked by her own wrongful conviction and subsequent three-year confinement, has been a catalyst for profound change, aiming to bring mass liberation to all marginalized groups of people in our communities and our country. Let's welcome Dr. Johnson. Next, we have Mr. Sean Kyler, who is Associate Director of Operations, Advocacy, and Partnerships at the Vera Institute of Justice. Mr. Kyler is instrumental in the team's work to end the ex exception clause contained in the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Prior to joining Vera in 2019, Mr. Kyler worked at Hudson Link for Higher Education in Prison as an Assistant Academic Coordinator. And I also will note that Mr. Kyler was also unfortunately wrongfully convicted. His work in Sing Sing Correctional Facility helped hundreds of men obtain college degrees, and he led the formation of the Alliance for Higher Education in Prison. In addition to Mr. Kyler's work at Vera, he is a member of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Institutional Review Board, which protects the rights and welfare of subjects involved in research activities conducted under their jurisdiction. Mr. Kyler holds a bachelor's in behavioral science from Mercy College and a master's in professional studies from New York Theology Seminary. Let's welcome Mr. Kyler. Well, thank you both uh, for taking your time and being here with us today. I thought we could level set and really share with the audience about what it means to be incarcerated, what it means to be behind the wall, to be stripped of your liberty, to be referred to as a number, to be told when to eat, sleep, and use the restroom. I'll open the floor to each of you. Well, I, uh, well, I would like to start off to say that um, the worst thing in the whole world is to be wrongfully convicted. And the worst thing in the whole world is to refuse to take a plea and you go to trial and you ultimately lose. The worst thing in the whole world is, you know, feeling the hate from, you know, the, the judge, the prosecutor. Uh, then you go off to, to jail, the, the guards and, and the other residents that you are a person that have maintained your innocence. And people don't understand that. They don't think about that. And even when you come home, it's the same thing. You don't get the high fives. I know I didn't. You don't get the, you know, the parade. Hey, you know, my homie is home. You don't get that. You get you get separated and, and people don't know that. It, it hurts us more mentally and is more of a challenge. And we get, we go through a different type of abuse. Uh, we go through abuse from everyone because of the fact that we were wrongfully convicted and we maintain our innocence. So I just wanted to just point that out because that's not really never talked about. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Johnson. And I think there's stats out there that it's a, uh, estimated that approximately 20,000 people have been falsely convicted. And we know that's probably more. Um, according to the National Registry of Exoneration, since 1989, more than 3,400 people have been exonerated for crimes they did not commit. Mr. Kyler? Yes, and thank you all for, um, for having me. Um, Dr. Johnson, and I hear you, and I want to uplift uh, 
that issue of, of, of really being ostracized. Um, unfortunately for me, I spent 24 and a half years um, incarcerated as well as three years on, on parole. Um, and I'm still fighting um, against the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, unfortunately. But I had to go through that process twice. Um, I actually, my first trial actually hung, ended in a hung jury. Um, and it was the creative ways that the prosecution used their witnesses to tell a different story the second time, which moved 12 people um, to conviction. And so when I think about that, and I think about that question, um, Molly, I think about how I lived at that time, at least half of my life in third person. Um, in order to survive and make it through prison, I literally had to live my life in third person to protect my sanity and my humanity. Um, when I was convicted, I remember saying to myself um, in the quote that I would never let this turn my heart gray. And I used that um, along with that I would not stop living. Like this was not the thing that was going to make me stop living. I wasn't going to give up. Um, I refused to give up. And so to in order to do that, I really had to look at myself as and protect myself in the other looking way. And so when I talked about me, I talked about me as the person. When I talked about the conviction, it was the defendant. And that was not me. And that's how I learned to survive and, and, and really fight in every court to the United States Supreme Court. Um, so I, I like to tell people, I used to play a lawyer um, without all the credentials. That's beautiful, beautiful, Mr. Kyler. Thank you for sharing that. And also I'd like to share with our audience that you were named the Valley Victorian for Hudson Class Link of 2013. So kudos to you on that very well-deserved honor. Um, and in your speech, Mr. Kyler, you told graduates that they have a duty to use education and an obligation to serve the community. Specifically, you stated, it is incumbent upon us to extend charity to others. Together, we can succeed. How does this powerful charge contribute to successful reentry for our brothers and sisters? Thank you, and, and, and thank you for uplifting that. When I wrote that sentence, um, I was really thinking about my classmates that we had been doing this work behind the wall already. Um, we had created this network of individuals where we said that we were going to help as many people obtain this education as possible. And so we kind of formed these groups, these study groups. Um, we would, you know, actually go out within the prison and talk to other men to try to get them to see the value of having this education and really paying it forward. Um, when I delivered that, I remember when I delivered that line um, and the pause uh, in between. And I looked out at, at, at the audience and I thought about the young children that were there, that were, for some of them, the first time seeing their parent or their sibling in a different manner. Um, it was an opportunity for all of us to just take a moment and just think about someone extended charity to us in order for us to be there. Um, at the time that I was um, in school, there wasn't Pell. And so someone had to raise money in order for me to have a seat and for in order for me to stand there at that graduation. And so it was incumbent upon myself as well as my classmates to also raise money for others. It wouldn't be until another seven years um, until Pell restoration was restored in 2020 um, and so we had to literally fight for every dollar in order to make this thing work. And, and, and I'm so thankful for Hudson Link. Um, but I'm also thankful for the women um, of Bedford Hills who 
oftentimes do not get the credit, but the reality is they are the backbones of the foundation for Hudson Link. Um, historically, Hudson Link got the paradigm and um, from them of how to make this process work uh, in a male facility. It was the women who actually did it first. And so I like to always make sure that they're recognized. Um, and equally, as an academic coordinator, I actually work um, with Ms. Ali Muhammad, who was one of the founding members of the program. And she was one of the architects of the process in, um, in Bedford Hills. And so there's a natural connection and I always make sure that I uplift her. That's beautiful. Thank you, Mr. Kyler. And if you could, is there a specific way that lawyers can help with Hudson Link in their efforts and education overall in that realm? So in now, um, Hudson Link is is kind of changing and shifting their what they're doing and they're moving into the reentry space. And so for lawyers, pro bono work to help us with um building these houses and 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 dealing with the government and getting resources um the ability to have a lawyer on staff you know to guide us through um land grants and and, and things of that nature is always um helpful we could always use a lawyer um but just thinking in general as i think about lawyers like lawyers are tasked with the duty of protecting the public. Like your oath is to protect us from the maliciousness of others as well as the government. And so that means something. Like I know sometimes we give lawyers a bad rap because we think or things didn't go our way sometimes. Um, but there is a mandate for lawyers to do more. And that's the reason behind giving back 50 hours uh, a year of pro bono service is that charity to be the protectors of human rights, to be protectors of social welfare, to protect people and keep people safe. That's excellent and very powerful. And we're urging for 50 or more, as many pro bono hours that you can give. And our lovely um, staff person, Allie, has put a link in the chat to learn more about Hudson Link and to be able to connect with Sean, Mr. Kyler, after this program, if you are interested in helping with those efforts. So Dr. Johnson, we'll turn to you. If you'd like to share a little bit more about your personal journey, um, and also how reentry is different for women, the unique challenges that women face when coming home and how it may be more difficult for them due to lack of programming specifically geared for the women's journey. Well, I would like to start my answer off with, I'm gonna go back to people that are wrongfully convicted um, and people that are dealing with, that are wrongfully convicted and that are dealing with white collar crimes, right? Um, that you you hear a lot of programs out there for you know people that are formerly drug dealers, drug addicts, um, and and even murderers, right? Is 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 programs out there for them? So, like for example, with me when I came home over five years ago, you know I went to so many different places as a wrongfully convicted woman on white collar crimes. Um, I went to so many different places and they was like, well, we can, you know, we can help you with your ID. Well, I got a driver's license. Well, we can help you with your birth certificate. I have a birth certificate. We can help you with your resume or here's my resume. Oh, holy cow. She's overqualified or she can take my job. Like no one could, no one could help me. No, no one could help me. And for, you know, for like 14, 15 months, I laid on my sofa and just got caught up on, on movies and technology and, and things of that nature. And even though I was gone three years, those three years felt like 30 years. However, for me, my only victory, well, I had two separate victories. The first victory was... Um, going to a place called uh, Community Family Life Services to learn how to tell my story. I had to learn how to tell my story. That was all I had. 
because nobody else could help me or would help me. And it's really unfortunate. Like, I mean, I went to so many different organizations that are getting like large funding, right? But nobody could help me. And so once I started learning how to tell my story, um, then, you know, I met uh, a, a woman by the name of Kiana Johnson. Um, she was someone told her about me. And so she, uh, you know, asked me to come, you know, work with her in terms of, of court watch. And so at first I did not want to do it, but then I was like, okay, well, maybe this is a way of the universe to saying, hey, you need help. I'm sending you help. And you keep telling this woman no. And so ultimately working with Life After Release, it, it changed my life. And it also kickstarted the, the, the parts of my brain that was shut down from the legal abuse that I went through from the, the justice system and 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 being turned down constantly because of the lack of resources for me and the fact that I was a woman. And and as of today, there's not enough resources for women, whether they're guilty or not guilty. They there are not enough resources. And then, you know, organizations that are out there today that are doing work for women that do have resources, a couple of them to be totally, you know, honest, I've had to check these organizations, you know, in terms of, you know, I'm an impacted woman and yes, I'm a professional and, and, and however you, you, you can't talk to me any type of way. You can't mistreat me. And if you're mistreating me and talking to me any type of way, that means that you're doing the other women that way. That, and they don't have a voice, but I have a voice. And so that's a problem. And, you know, we as women, we must learn how to take care of each other because that's what they did. That's what the Native American women did. That's what the African women did. That's what the Latino women did. That, this is what our ancestors did. We took the women took care of one another. But in this container and reentry, that's not happening. That that's not happening, and it's really unfortunate. So it was it was very difficult for me. It was hard. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Johnson. And we're so happy that you were able to overcome those challenges and to be able to find organizations that were in a position to assist you. So for both of you, what obligation do lawyers have to find a way to support their clients throughout the journey when they return home to reach others who are still away but are anticipating release? What can lawyers do in advance to set them up for success? What is lawyer? What are lawyers' obligations to do those things? Shall I go first? Uh, you go first. Um, and so can I just back up um for a second? Uh Nolly, I just I just wanna I just wanna give a little commentary on, on, on Dr. Johnson's um words and 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 really uplift some things that and I and by no means as a male who went through the system whose situation is different, am I am I speaking about the horrendous issues that women go through and how we treat women um, that are returning um, to our communities. And we have to understand that women are the fastest growing demographic in prison. Um, and we also have to really visualize that 98% of the people who are incarcerated will be returning back to the community. And we must create systems, not just for people to survive, but to thrive. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like? And, 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 and that looks like stable housing, stable employment. That looks like people actually having something as simple as identification card. It is so hard for men and women coming home to get a state issued identification card. And we, things that we take for granted, and I, and I, and I say we, so that everyone can understand that 
you have one in your pocket. I have one in my pocket. I have a driver's license. But luckily for me in New York, where there are some resources, um, I was able to get it while I was at my parole office to reporting. But that's not everywhere. Like that system is not designed everywhere. And to return back to society without these things is added stress to a stressful situation of a person coming back into society. Just think, I've been gone for almost 25 years. I was fortunate because I had access to a computer through school. So I was able to understand technology when I came home. Um, and, and was released. So I had a leg up. But when Dr. Johnson started talking about the women and these different organizations, they're all fighting for the same resources, unfortunately, because the resources are so limited. People are coming home not prepared for the society that they're entering into. Reality check. When I went to prison, they only had flip phones. For those that are in the audience, if you can remember, they only had Motorola flip phones then. Mm -hmm. When I came home, I was handed a smartphone that had the world at my fingertips. We don't I think sometimes we don't really sit down and, and, and think about the things that and how technology has really progressed. When I left prison, we had cassette tapes. I don't know if people in the audience will understand what a cassette <laughs> tape is, mm -hmm. but I had a Walkman. It had to be clear, but I had a Walkman. And although we tried to fight against that, we had no outside support to raise the issue of how these companies were fleecing our families and the men and women incarcerated by having these exorbitant prices for things that we needed in commissary. And so these are areas where lawyers, if having access to lawyers, could help during the journey. I want to make sure I tied all together to your question. <laughs> um, that was wonderful. Thank you. And so... I would have loved to have been it. I, I would say for me, the first 15 years of my incarceration, I had, actually I would say 17 years of my incarceration, I had contact with a lawyer throughout those first 17 years. Um, there were periods where I didn't because I wasn't represented, but I had contact with uh, attorneys. Um, some good, some bad. It goes with the, you know, it goes with the territory. But I, I, for Dr. Johnson as a professional, like there are so many organizations that are not equipped with handling a person who has come home that is a professional, that was a professional before their incarceration. Because that is not the norm, unfortunately, and that's not the product coming out of the prisons. When you think about the programming there, it's not conducive to being a professional or putting you on a path to become a professional. If you don't have um, access to higher education, post-secondary education in these prisons, you're producing laborers is what you're producing out of the prison system. You're producing laborers. And that's what these organizations that are doing this work, these are the jobs that they are, that they have access to. And so these are the trainings that they have access to, unfortunately. And so I, I, I hear you, Dr. Johnson, um, and I appreciate your work in this space. Thank you, Mr. Kyler. Dr. Johnson, do you have anything to add? In terms of where does an attorney or attorneys fall into line in terms of reentry, 
I think that uh, uh, attorneys have an obligation, especially your 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 attorney that went with you to sentencing or your post-conviction attorney, like I've been to the Supreme Court twice, or your post-conviction attorney or your sentencing attorney, they have an obligation to you to make sure that you are educated on, you know, re-entry or when you come home, you can, you should be able to pick up the phone because, you know, post-conviction is expensive. Let's be clear. And so they should be obligated to you to at least take your phone call and say, okay, um, Dr. Johnson, um, you know, there's some resources over here or some resources over there, but that's not the case. You know, the, the, the you know, that attorney will tell you real quick, well, you know, we, you know, I stopped working on your case, you know, when we lost in the Supreme court or I stopped working on your case at sentencing or, or well, well, okay, well, I, well, now I don't have no money. You took all my money. So I need help. Can you help? No, well, I, I don't I don't do that, you know, and it's really unfortunate and it's, it's, it's a hurtful thing, especially when, you know, your, you know, your 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 family, then then drain you. I didn't drain my pockets. I didn't drain my family's pockets. And then they say that they can't help. That's that's not that's that's inhumane. And, you know. I just think that I I know that attorneys need to be more involved, especially when a lot of them did not do their best to stop you from going to jail. Let's be clear. You know what I mean? So they should have at least some type of conscious or something. Darn, I messed up at trial and they, and and my client ended up going to jail. Let me, you know, okay, they calling me now. Let me go ahead and try to see if I can help, you know, at least get their secretary or someone to kind of just call around and get some type of resources that that former client needed. It, it should be ma mandatory that uh, attorneys, especially defense attorneys, and you know, are 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 contributing to reentry, whether a person is 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 guilty or not, and that's just the the, the crux of it. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's very helpful, Dr. Johnson. And I guess we could shift a little bit to. Um, on top of just the basic needs as far as IDs, housing, employment, the technical issues that go into reentry. Some folks are put on an ankle monitor. Some folks are at a halfway house. Some persons have to, you know, report in to the case managers and, and probation officers. And we're doing a web series now about how the different players of the system impact the justice system overall. Um, so in particular with, with technical violations, Dr. Johnson, you published a book, which we'll link to in the chat called The Pretense of Justice. And you talk about ankle monitors and you share that sometimes the officer would call you and say, you're not at home. They're looking at the screen and you're not at home. And you'll reply and tell them, I am at home. You just called me on my landline. Yeah. So things like that that are happening, as you mentioned, people who don't have a voice, who don't have access to challenge these technical things, who are getting jobs but not being approved by their officer to take the job. What should lawyers know about this and how can lawyers fix these issues? Well, well first off, I, I probably need to do a class with some attorneys to, to let them know since I didn't have any attorneys helping me at the time when I was going through my process and now this, this is what helping ourselves to transform do we act as mediators for probation officers, for parole officers, for detention, uh, people that do the home detention, ankle monitors. We act as, as uh, uh, we are the go-between. So like if, if a person, you know, have contacted my organization and they said, you know, the probation officer is saying that I did this and that's not true, or the ankle monitor keeps going off and I keep telling the detention people that that is something wrong with their device and they they don't believe me. We're able to go in and intervene. And and again, people who their attorneys that that went to sentencing with them or went to did post conviction with them that person should be able to pick up the phone and call an attorney. They shouldn't have to come find Dr. Carmen Johnson and helping ourselves to transform. They should be able to call their old attorney and say, look, I'm having issues. This ankle monitor is not working. They're telling me I'm lying. They gave me a ticket. I got to be on this ankle monitor another 30 days and I already got nine more months to go. And I mean, we should be able to pick up the phone and call our former attorneys to tell them we are having issues. 
You know what I mean? And but the first thing to come to mind, well, I'll charge you a thousand dollars and call. Like, why would why you already got a hundred thousand from me and my family? You know, this is what I'm thinking. Like, you know, why why would what you know why people don't have money when they come home? Because when you come home, you broke your your family broke because the commissary is too much, and you there are attorneys out there, and they will say, well, you know, you got to pay me. $1,000. You got to pay me $500. You got to pay me $700 just to make a phone call, just to just to, to get the, the records that the parole officer filed in court saying that I did this and that and it's a lie. They shouldn't have to come to help. And I, I mean, I take all the clients but and don't charge. But I thank God that people now have a safe haven that they can come to. However, this is the attorneys that your defense attorney your post-conviction attorney, your sentencing attorney. This is the last attorney you came in contact with before you went to jail. You should still, it should still be an open door. It should still be an open door for you to call and say, I'm having issues. But that's not the case. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Johnson. We really appreciate your passion and your willingness to share your experiences so that change can occur. And Mr. Kyler, do you have any thoughts um, out of New York and, and what you all are doing to reform technical issues? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so in New York, um, in 2022, I want to say, um, with the help of attorneys, of course, um, doing legislative drafting, um, working in coalitions, we were able to pass the Less is More Act, um, which drastically changed how technical violations, one, are administered, um, but for things like missing a curfew or not reporting, those were no longer considered technical violations that would send someone um, back to prison, actually. Um, because what we know is that technical violations do not increase public safety. When you disrupt a person who has been doing the right thing, and for some reason, the train may have been late um, for any untold number of minuscule reasons, the person may miss a curfew. Traffic may have been bad. There may have been an accident. The person couldn't get um, to their residence by a designated time of 7 o'clock or 9 o'clock. And some parole officers, unfortunately, are hell bent on making sure that every rule is followed to the T, unfortunately. And there's no wiggle room. And that's not to say that I'm, you know, looking down on parole officers or probation officers because their experiences are their experiences. However, life happens to people. And a person's life shouldn't be disrupted because they were late for an appointment or missed an appointment, or there was a technical issue that happened with their technology. Like that is insane to me that you would feel comfortable disrupting what a person has achieved thus far for something that minuscule. Like what happens to their body of work, their history before this incident. And so in New York, um, we use that to 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 create uh, a lot of change. Um, and we were able to get less is more passed, uh, which only allowed on the, a maximum of 30 days of incarceration for the extreme cases. That's excellent. Thank you for sharing that and kudos to you on that victory. Um, Dr. Johnson, your organization has played a critical role as well in legislative efforts here locally and on the national level. Um, most recently, um, your efforts to examine conditions of confinement and custody in death, in death custodies um, in the state of Maryland. How has your advocacy efforts helped you serve those who are returning home and how can lawyers help uplift your work? Well, my advocacy, well, my lived experience and the fact that I had no place to go in terms of help when I came home helped me. And 
you know, and that's why my sister, you know, started helping ourselves to transform and I let it sit on the floor for a couple of years because I wasn't mentally prepared to handle that. But in terms of today, I just want to uh, just say that some of the, I surround myself with uh, attorneys now, and I just want to just name some of the, the, the boards and committees that I sit on that are con consist of attorneys. So um, I sat on the transition team for Governor Moore. I sat on two of his subcommittees, education and reentry, which they were surrounded by attorneys. Um, I sit on the advisory board for our the wonderful Congressman Glenn Ivey, and that's on the federal side. Um, I sit on the reentry board for Madam uh, County Exec, also Brooks in Prince George's County. It's called the Returning Citizens Affairs Division. Um, I sit on the Attorney General for the state of Maryland, and also uh, he started him and the District Public Defender for the state of Maryland. They studied uh, the Maryland Equitable Justice Collaborative, and so I sit on law enforcement policy and procedures, jails, prison, detention centers, and reform. The three subcommittees is healthcare, mental health, and the jails and prisons, uh, decarceration, parole and probation, education programs and jails, and an array of other boards and committees that I sit on that consist on, that consist with attorneys. And so I surround myself with attorneys with that lived experience, explaining to them and getting them to understand why A, B, C, D, and E needs to be done. And whether it's behind the wall or re-entry, I have been instrumental, I feel, in terms of educating attorneys on what's really going on and what's really, really happening. And the more we that have been through this injustice system, the more we speak out, the more we let these attorneys know, especially ones that are sitting in these elected positions, let them know what's really going on, you know, the better we'll be. And so that's what I'm doing is educating as many attorneys as possible and sitting on these boards, sitting at these tables, making decisions and letting them know this is what's happening. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I see strive happening. I see uh, differences being made, but more, more differences need to be made. More, more work needs to be done. Attorneys need to be doing more and not just uh, attorneys that are in elected positions. I go wow. back to the sentencing attorneys. I go back to the post-conviction attorneys. I go back to them. They have an obligation to their clients, former clients. Dr. Johnson. Yes. That list is incredibly impressive. You deserve the most kudos for your time. I understand those positions are volunteer. And if that does not inspire each and every one of us to raise our hand, to give those 50 hours to do more, I don't know what will. So thank you so much for raising that up. And we are truly grateful for you and all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Kyler, we also want to thank you and lift you up and applaud you for all of the work that you do in work, um, in your career and outside um, as well. And Vera is committed, Vera Institute of Justice is committed to removing barriers to housing to ensure that those impacted by our unjust criminal system get a real opportunity to re-enter their communities and succeed and thrive. Vera's Opening Doors to Housing Initiative reports that incarcerated people are 10 times, 10 mm -hmm. times more likely to be unhoused than the general public. I mean, we can't ignore that stat. And again, lawyers should feel an obligation to help our persons coming home with finding housing, with getting in, with challenging um, any barriers on that front. Do you have anything to add about your initiative at Vera? Yes, our, so so thank you for that. Um, our Opening Doors um, initiative, our, our team, is a small but a mighty team. And, and what we, at, at the core, we understand that housing makes incredible impact on public safety. When a person is not... I, and, and, when I when I talk about this, when I think about it, I always think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and those foundational needs um, and what they really mean in human life. 
And so when a person has stable housing, stable employment, we know that they're less likely to commit crime. Additionally, we know the evidence shows that people who have um, a conviction or, or an arrest in their background normally only have one arrest, the majority of people. We also know that having a criminal uh, background has no bearing on whether or not someone will be a good tenant or a neighbor. So, so that myth of having you know, a dangerous tenant in order to exclude them, you know, from policy that deny people housing. And oftentimes those, you know, those instances are decades old. And that person is not that same person who's before them. And and, and that's an issue that we see as well in, in parole, in the parole space, even when we're, we're taking these convictions or these arrests or these involvement with the criminal legal system and we're just constantly using them to deny people to make them second class citizens and so our open the doors um team is working you know for fair housing in michigan um in minnesota in maryland um as well as oklahoma um and we're in other states you know trying to get policies and working with, with agencies to create policies that will allow for people to look at, realists to look at the criminal history. However, it's later on in the process and not at the front door. Because if if I meet you and I talk to you and I, and, and I have a first impression of you that is favorable, then if I find out later on that, okay, well, he had a, an arrest 25 years ago, it has less of an impact than if I saw it first and then I met you. And so we're not saying that you should never look at criminal history, but there is a place and a time to look at that after you've really judged the person that is before you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Dr. Johnson, do you have anything to add on housing? Oh, housing is a big issue. You know, I, I uh, when I left, I was arrested immediately at trial. The trial was stopped and I had a house and had a tenant in it. And um, so I couldn't, you know, I didn't have the benevolence to handle my business affairs or my personal affairs. And so I didn't find out my house went into foreclosure. My house was gone until I was at the halfway house and I was sit sitting there like the second day my sister was on the phone. She was like, I got something to tell you. Okay, what is that? Because I'm thinking I'm going home in a couple of days or whatever the situation is, and my house was gone. So then that landed a whole nother array of issues. I had to sit at the halfway house another two months or something to that effect. And, um, you know, and, you know, thank goodness, you know, my family is supportive and, you know, you know, they was able, you know, to you know, to put a place in, 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 in their name to help me. But most people don't have that, especially if they spent a lot of time behind the wall. Their parents are gone. They, they probably didn't have any kids or anything like that. Housing is a big issue. But instead of uh, uh, people building uh, housing for returning citizens, they're steady building new jails. So that's the issue. Yes, but we could have a whole nother webinar on. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Johnson. And, and we'll turn to some audience Q&A now. Um, Ms. Chantel Cloud asked, what about healing resources? There is so much trauma from the beginning to the end. Um, and we also have a question um, from Ms. Portia of CFLS. I'm asking about um, social workers and whether firms should have them on staff to address some of these other issues that are related to returning um, to the community. So I open those questions to both of you. The importance of social work support. Social work support is fine and holistic healing is even better. However, for me at helping ourselves to transform, I urge different attorneys on different levels to come and, and, and sit on my board or give pro bono hours. I'm, I'm calling out to you all. I'm crying out to you all, you know, because I need to make sure I'm covered 
And, you know, and, you know, I was politically hit. And so for me, you know, I'm out there and, and I'm and I'm helping people that's behind the wall, helping people that are home and things of that nature. My biggest thing is I will I want to continue to surround myself with attorneys, but social workers are needed. Holistic healing is needed. But my cry is, is for attorneys to come work with helping ourselves to transform, sit on our board, give pro bono hours in every array of this justice system. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Mr. Kyler? Uh, yes, and, and, and I second it. And I also understand, um, I want to list up oftentimes what happens from the ground out of necessity. Um, my group, the part of the group that I was speaking to at my graduation, we're all, a large percentage of us are out. And so we have our own peer-to-peer -peer network that we created in order to help us. Because if we're not going to help us, we can't look outward for others to help us. And so that bond that we formed during school, that bond has kept us safe, kept us out of trouble, kept us on a steady path. Um, my, my guys, I would say are overachievers. Um, we were overachievers in school. Um, what separated the valedictorian from the fifth place person was less than a percentage point. And so we're all out here working hard, um, taking care of each other, providing that support to each other. We have a WhatsApp group that we converse with each other every day, multiple times a day. Um, we provide job leads. We provide words of encouragement. Um, we provide spaces, safe spaces, for us to have the conversation for people who are being uh, released and returned back to society because we've all had different experiences and someone can draw from our experience. Um, I like to tell people that from the outside, people think that your family is your greatest support. And unfortunately, it's not. Your greatest support is the people who actually went through this process with you because they're the only people that can truly understand when you say a thing and what that really, really means. When a person tells me, my family is out there having this party, but I want to be in my room. I understand what that means. Can you talk to me? Let's talk to, let's talk through this. Because there's nothing wrong with you and there's nothing wrong with them. It's the trauma that you went through through decades of being in a cell by yourself in a system that forges individuality that doesn't actually lift up family. They present these things, but they don't really put their, their foot down and their mouth and their money out front. Mr. Kyler, that is powerful. And we are grateful for you for leading that WhatsApp group for being that peer-to-peer -peer supporter, which is so powerful and critical for ones who are returning home and for their journey. Um, and that could be another call to action for lawyers. How can we support these peer-to-peer -peer networks, not run them, but support them um, to move forward and to have the resource that they need so persons returning home, like Dr. Johnson, don't have to go door to door and be denied. So we have these resources in place. When someone steps foot off of that bus, they know where to go. They have a hand that is there that will be by their side throughout their journey. Um, we have one more question before we close out today. Um, Dr. Ratcliffe asked, do either of you feel there should be social program funds allocated for reentry that could assist both the individual returning and also their attorney? I agree with that. Yep, I agree with that. Absolutely, funding um, is necessary. Um, this work is not cheap by any means. Um, there is there is 
uh, a motion working this way in New York um, that would actually um, increase the gate, the release money. Um, in New York, they give you $40 and a train ticket um, and say, you know, don't come back. Um, however, like I said earlier, these organizations that's doing this incredible, this hard work on the ground lack so many resources, lack funding. It is so hard to get funding. Um, and in this space, you know, unfortunately, we're in election year. Um, the philanthropic money is is drying up in the criminal legal space. Um, philanthropists are, are, are really looking at certain things that they want to invest in, but reentry is not um, top of mind. But at the same time, again, we all deserve to be and feel safe. If I can leave you with one thing, we all deserve to be and feel safe. Thank you, Mr. Kyler. That just gave me chills. We all deserve to be and feel safe. Thank you. And thank you for your work, for your time, for your dedication, for being here with us today and welcome home. Dr. Johnson, do you have any closing remarks or call to action for our audience today? Um, I have eight interns, amazing interns that work with me that uh, seven of them uh, uh, took up a criminal, just some type of criminal justice studies. And, um, and so I'm asking for actual attorneys to come sit on my board or have an open line where I can call them in terms of, of, of loved ones that have come home or are still behind the wall. That's what I, I need, willing to do pro bono work or sit on the board of helping ourselves to transform, please. I need you, SOS. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. And we put links in the chat for persons to connect with you directly, and we will send out resources and we'll also have it in the comment section. Um, this webinar will be available on YouTube for the world to watch. Um, and to close this out, I'd like to share, um, there's a nonprofit organization in DC called Free Minds Book Club and Writing Workshop that serves youth charged as adults. The organization teaches the people that they serve that while their body may not be free, that you can keep your mind free with books and creative writing. And I'd like to share a poem by one of the members. It reads, 400 and some years ago, they brought us to this land. 400 and some years ago, I couldn't be a man. 400 and some years ago, they called us a slave. 400 and some years ago, they made us behave. 400 and some years ago, they made us figure. 400 and some years ago, my name was 400 and some years ago, they made us wear chains. 400 and some years ago, and it's still the same. So thank you for all of you for joining us with this free webinar today. We would like to express our extreme gratitude to our esteemed panelists. Let's give them a round of applause, a virtual round of applause here. Dr. Johnson, Mr. Kyler, you are incredible. We love you. Keep pushing forward and we'll always will be here to support you. The section of civil rights and social justice provides free webinars such as this one and other resources for legal professionals and advocates nationwide. We hope this has helped you in your work. And if you can, please consider joining and becoming an active member of the ABA. You may learn more at AmericanBar.org. Bye-bye.